So hey everyone, welcome back to I'm That Geek Show, the show that puts you face to face with world experts, thought leaders, and people who have been there before, not only dreamers, but actually doers. So you can shorten up the learning curve for you guys where you can come in and pick their brain in real time. And you can do that by going into amthatgeek.com forward slash live right now. There's gonna be a button, click it, hop in into, uh, into our show so we can in- interact with you and our guest in real time. And today we have with us the amazing, the trendsetter, as called by uh, Colorado Bees, <laughs> JV Kellogg. How are you, JV? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. You are one of the, uh, and let me, I always do that. Hold on a second. There we go. You're one of the very uh, amazing pre- people that are showing up. They are the face of the company on a lot of social, right? YouTube, uh, Instagram, videos, uh, content but not very interacting, not, much, not really interacting with, uh, with the clients. So I'm very excited that we get to actually pick your brain in real time. Um, so before we get there, actually, I want to tell you a little bit about JB. So first of all, he is the co-founder and co-CEO of the fastest growing technology company in the country. Madwire, which is one of the companies, has grown from two people to over 550 people in just 10 years. And we're going to talk about how they did that with very, very little automation, which is amazing when you think about a technology company. Um, so JB is the co-founder and the co-CEO of Madwire, Marketing 360, Top Rated Local, which are popular platforms used to help small businesses grow. Um, and as a result of that, Madwire has over 10,000 clients with an impressive average rating of 4.9 stars across 2,500 online reviews, which is amazing when you think about that. Um, You are very passionate about company culture, which I've seen in your videos, and I've talked to your employees, and it shows that uh, culture is a big thing. And you are working with your brother. (laughs) So we talked about that just a little bit. What is it like to mix family and business, JB? It's great. You know, I work with, uh, you know, my dad and I founded the company, the two of us, and then I have my brother-in-law here, several cousins. I think we have 12 or 13 people from my family that do work here. And um, it's been great. You know, we don't treat each other any different than we would anybody else here. You know, we're all striving for the same goal, uh, pushing for the same mission and, and held accountable to the same standards as everybody else. And so ultimately we have to do our part and we have to perform well and be good members of the culture, and, and we all are, and so it's been successful. Do you ever feel like, you know, family members feel like they can tell you whatever they want because you're family, and they can be like, oh, come on, you know, I've seen you at dinner, I'll talk to you about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe a little bit, but for the most part, you know, we try to have an open and honest communication culture in general, so I, I feel like our senior leaders and, and whatnot um, are just as comfortable telling me with, you know, telling me about what's not working as a family member, you know, and vice versa. So it, it's been it's been pretty much a seamless process. It really hasn't felt a lot different. That's pretty cool uh, because I know within my family, even at the dinner table, we don't always get along, right? Let alone work together. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So yeah. tell me, like, before we dive into how you run your company, and you know, uh, like I was saying before, it's really amazing how you're a marketing company that uses very little automation to grow. Um, what gets you up in the morning? <laughs> uh, well, just the mission, you know, we're trying to help small businesses grow, and we feel like when we do a good job of that, it makes the world a better place. And so part of our mission is creating jobs. And so one of those things is growing our company. You know, the, the bigger that we grow, the more jobs that we provide. And so that gets me up in the morning is the excitement of providing more jobs um, and, and, and doing well enough that the folks that do work for us do very well. And then also do a good job for our customers so that they can hire people and create jobs as well. So that's exciting to me on a daily basis. And as far as, you know, automation goes, You know, we started the company, you know, very much service based. So we were, you know, we wanted to get into technology. We just, you know, we had no previous experience in the marketing space. And so we needed to learn. And so we started just by offering services. So 
building customer relationships and, and having a good consultative sales process was something that we just started with. And um, there was no automation there. I mean, it was manual. You were calling, emailing, building a relationship, trying to figure out what their goals were, developing a strategy to reach those goals. And then even on the marketing execution side, it was very much manual. But over the years, you know, we've understood what technology pieces we needed to build. And so we have built things over the years and, and added in the element of automation, streamline and optimization along the way, of course. Uh, but even today, you know, we believe that having that relationship with the customer um, is extremely important as part of our overall process. So we still focus on that. I love that because you kind of like tapped into my next question, like what is it like to, you know, at the very start? So I know when I started, you know, I was pretty much clueless about most of things. I had one or two skills that I was like, okay, I'm really great at it. And I know a lot of people who are watching us right now, they're going like, you know, I might be really good at graphic design or I might be really good at just like, um, you know, I have an eye for interior design or something like that. But how do you go and turn that into an actual business? Right. Uh, well, you know, we knew businesses need marketing when we started. You know, we could see that marketing was changing. People were um, still advertising in the phone book and the newspaper and those sorts of traditional methods. And digital marketing was was new and it was up and coming. Um, previously, my dad and I were, you know, working in a futures and commodities brokerage a company my dad had founded uh, many years before. And so we were already doing digital marketing on that front. We were already um, understanding how Google AdWords worked and how email marketing worked and how these digital channels could really drive inbound leads and those were the best leads of all. And so we realized that we had a talent here that we were able to execute on in the trading industry, which is very, very competitive. Yeah. And we could see that small business was making a shift. They were going to be shifting onto the digital scene with regards to marketing. So we saw the opportunity there. Um, I had experience with marketing and design a little bit. I'd self-taught my, myself a lot of those things. And so we just said, hey, we see this opportunity. Let's go ahead and, and take advantage of this. And so, you know, we just went for it. There's never a guarantee. You don't know if it's going to be successful or not, but we thought that we would be and we believed in it and we weren't going to stop until we were. So we just cold turkey gave away all of our trading accounts and just you know moved into the new space and, and, and went after it. Luckily, it paid off. Which is amazing, you know, um, a lot of people, and let me make sure that everybody's muted. Yep, so a lot of people are saying that, uh, you know, it's scary, right? And there's a lot of risk and risk and rewards are usually kind of like people avert risk a lot. And like I said, Colorado Bees uh, called you a trendsetter who relishes risk. So are there any risks that you're like, okay, I'm gonna, this is gonna pan out fantastically, I'm gonna go for it, and then it turned out to be uh, a big mistake? When did that happen and what did you learn from it? Gosh, you know, we've we've taken risks since day one. I mean, we came from the trading industry, so it's no riskier than that. I mean, you're investing in trades and losing money left and right. And so, um, you know, for us, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You know, we, we do it and it doesn't work. And so we have to go back to doing what we already know, trading, great, you know, but the best thing that could happen is this we're successful and we could see other companies were successful in the space. So there's no reason we couldn't be and we're competitive. so. We felt pretty confident um, when we made that leap. And then all along our history of Madwire, you know, we've we've made uh, we've made risky moves. And, you know, we always say like, hey, you know what, like, let's just go for it. And the worst thing that's going to happen is it doesn't work and we just go a different direction, you know. Um, so we generally make changes pretty quick around here. You know, if somebody has a big idea, a new product idea, a new process idea, whatever it is. If it sounds like a good idea, hey, let's do it, you know? And if it doesn't work, we'll just stop doing it. Um, but I would rather make a quick decision and move and be nimble and be fast than overthink something too long, right? You're gonna learn faster just by trying it. So that's kind of been our strategy from the beginning. So it's a very kind of risk-based culture with, uh, with everybody kind of on the same page with, hey, change is gonna happen and that's a good thing. We're just gonna be adjusting. If it's not working, we're gonna adjust to something that is. So ultimately it's a good outcome either way. So when you are deciding who to hire, and I hear myself twice for some reason, I don't know if that's you or me. Um, when you decide who to hire, do you look for someone that has that mindset of like, okay, fail fast, risk, you know, be a team player, or are there any skills or anything else that they need to bring to the table before they can join your team? Yeah, I mean, I would sum that up as entrepreneurial spirit. You know, we look for entrepreneurs here, and so that's what fits our culture. And so we look for those types of people, that type of personality fit. 
Um, really like a positive mindset, I think is what it boils down to. Um, if you have somebody with a positive mindset, they're generally going to have a positive outcome. If they have a negative mindset, they're going to take longer to do everything and they're going to ultimately have a negative outcome. Yeah. So we look for people with positive mindsets. You can kind of feel that in the interviews. Um, we do a lot of group interviews now. And so those people tend to stand out and rise to the top. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for is a positive minded person that fits our culture because um, we have pretty good training programs. We're, we're confident we can train them what they need to know. We're just looking for the right fit. So that's super interesting. Um, you know, as someone who has started, you know, solo business, a lot of a lot of people who are watching us right now are probably doing a lot of this stuff on their own and they feel like they need to know so much in order to grow. Um, and then hiring people and now you get into the game of, OK, how much time it will take me to train you? And then by the time I finish training you, are you even a good fit for the culture? Can you even do what I ask you to do? And you know, will I do it faster if I didn't have to train you? So scaling is a big issue for a lot of people, right? There's a difference between actually doing and managing, right? So how did you do that transfer? Because you started growing your own business, realizing, wow, I'm doing it fantastically for myself. Let me do it for other people. How do you move from like doing it and then to managing and leading it? Right. Well, that's a learning process in and of itself, just scaling up and building teams. I mean, when we started Madwire, I did every job, you know, I did it all. And then pretty soon I couldn't do it all. So then I, I taught somebody how to do one piece and train them. And then they did that piece. And little by little, you started to build out people and teams and then departments and then leaders. And what works with 20 doesn't work with 100. And what, works, what worked with 100 isn't working with 500. So you continually have to adapt and adjust um, your team structures and your processes and your leadership along the way. Um, but you can only reach your mission if you have a team of people to help you get there. You can't do it by yourself, right? Unless yeah. it's a small yeah. mission. But we have a big mission. It's going to take a lot of people. And so we just need to be nimble. What we've done over the years is just listen to feedback. Um, we do something every Friday. Um, it's once a month now, it used to be every Friday, but it's it's the first Friday of every month now. We call it a 410. Mm -hmm. And at four o'clock, we close at four. And so people from four to 410 submit a quick form. And that, that quick form gives shout outs to their teammates, but it also gives ideas for improvement. And that's where we find a ton of ideas. You know, people put those ideas in there and say, hey, this process is broken. This team, you know, needs to have this kind of a change. We need to sell that kind of a product, whatever it is. And when you when you're feeling the heartbeat of the company and listening to their feedback, it's you know it's that old adage like two heads are stronger than one. Well, 500 heads is way stronger than one. So if you're constantly listening to that on an ongoing basis, you're getting smarter as you go, and you just make adjustments as you go based on kind of what the team is saying. Is so what we've done. I love that because that actually takes the the burden off of you, right, and makes them participate and be an active participants of the company which actually really explains why they are so passionate about what you're doing. And I have to tell you guys, so I met, uh, I came across Marketing 360 through a referral from a really good friend, uh, Luz Delia Gerber. And I went to the website and I wanted to see what their prices were and I filled up a form and the email I got had no prices. <laughs> and now I know it's on purpose. What I did get is a text message from one of their guys. And to be completely transparent, I was like, ah, oh, they're going to be selling me now face to face. It totally did not go that way. It was like, hey, who referred you? We want to reward them. We want to connect you with the right person. And then I was connected to Jordan on your team. And that guy is just a ball of energy. And he was so friendly and so nice. I started feeling like I'm talking to a buddy and a friend and not someone who's going to be like, no, you have to sell, you know, you have to buy one of my packages. And when I was talking to him about that, different experience that I had with him, he said, yes, this is something that Marketing 360 really, really cultivates. And a lot of people are leaving different companies and coming to you mostly because of the culture and what it feels like to be a part of that team. So as a leader, how do you instill that in your uh, in your people? Uh, well, I think you have to lead by example, you know, um, they're going to be a reflection of you as the leader and all of your leaders. And so what we've always said this since the beginning is our mission is to help small businesses grow. And it doesn't mean we have to be the ones doing it, right? Mm. As long as we're giving them good information, if they want to do it themselves, if they have an internal team. So when somebody calls in, they're looking for help. It doesn't mean that uh, they're going to go with us, but we can provide them good information. We could try to understand their business and try to point them down the right 
track um, should we be able to help them and that's achieving our mission and hopefully a lot of times they'll say hey you know what this sounds pretty good and i think the best way to do this is to have you help me do that right and we're going to mm-hmm. open those accounts but if we have the right mindset of just helping people then it's always going to work out and so we always say around here take care of the customer and the customer will take care of you I like that. So just always have that your number one focus and it always seems to, to work out I like that, especially in this online marketing where everything is about selling and numbers and bottom lines and all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it really does set you apart. Uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, a few days ago, I posted a question on all my social platforms and I said, hey, what would you ask the co-founder, the co-CEO of the fastest growing technology company in the country? And I don't know if you've seen this, JB, but <laughs> the comments are all over the gamut, right? Okay. Everything from like, how dare you be so successful? And what about the poor people in Africa to you must be a psychopath because only psychopaths succeed uh, to what are you going to do for the planet? Right? Because it's your responsibility as a CEO to do something for the planet and everything else that came actually a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to share the the interesting questions with you. Uh, but before I do, do you get that a lot when people come to you and they assume that, you know, just because you're running these companies, you must be a psychopath? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard the psychopath one before. I haven't heard <laughs> that one, but uh, I, I've, I've heard a lot over the years, that's for sure. So I tend to have a short memory and I just move <laughs> forward. If it's a bad thing, if it's a good thing, I pass it along to our teammates. So. I love that. Um, actually, that lady with the psychopath, it's, if you ever care about this, she started sharing videos about like, look, this is uh, a trade among successful people. Um, um, you know, who would have funk? But uh, so one of the interesting questions is like, how do you keep up with new changes that are happening in marketing since you are one of the leading companies in that area? How do you keep up with that? You know, we we're pretty on top of it because we just have so many people now that are just seeing things from so many angles and we work with so many different types of of businesses, Um, e-commerce businesses, local businesses, every kind of business you could think of, we pretty much work with. And so we're constantly being exposed to the new things, the new channels, the new strategies. And honestly, a lot of times our clients will call us too and ask us, hey, you know, what about this? I heard about that, you know, and and we'll look into it if, if we're not even quite sure, but it keeps us pretty on top of it. Um, and so just listening to our clients, listening to our team um, keeps us ahead of the curve, I think, in terms of marketing and, and staying kind of at the tip of the sword, I think, for small business marketing anyways. I love that because that goes back into relationships and actually talking to people and not guessing what might happen, right? <laughs> Um, how do you think, uh, you know, in terms of marketing, how do you think AI is going to affect on marketing and um, the way our society is going? Well, with regards to marketing, I think it's just about optimizing your dollars. I mean, marketing at, at the core of it, it just comes down to spend more of your money on what's working and less of your money on what's not. I mean, that's it. So if I ran ads across all the different channels online, Google, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube TV, Pandora Radio, a hundred others, and I just turned all those budgets on, theoretically with AI, I should be able to just walk away and come back a month later and it should have optimized everything down to the few keywords that work on Google, the few ad campaigns and audiences that work on Facebook, et cetera, so that I am, am actually getting the most positive return possible for my investment. And I didn't have to even lift a finger, um, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of technology that goes into that, obviously. Um, I think you'll still want a creative mind to help set it up. You're gonna want a creative person to think about the conversion funnel and the call to action and the branding and, and, the, and the video series and, and everything else. But with AI, I think you could, if you set it up properly and have have good quality collateral and design, you should be able to turn it on and it should be able to optimize itself over time. So that's something that we're working on um, right now is, is, is the ability to do that. And you need two pieces. You need to know where your customer came from and you need to know what your revenue is. And so if you have those things, you can say, hey, most of my customers are coming from here. That's costing me this much. And then here's my revenue I'm generating on the back end and closing that loop. Mm-hmm. is important once you can close the loop then you can optimize based on that data and so right now we're working on closing that loop with the payment data and the marketing data um to truly understand if we spent a thousand dollars on our facebook ad how much did we make lifetime value in terms of revenue 
Um, once we have that information fully connected, then optimizing in an automated way isn't as complicated. Love that. There's a, so let, let's break this down for a little bit, because a lot of people don't know how you guys operate, right? Uh, what your, what's your flow? You're very active on social media. You have, I think, 45,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube, uh, tens of thousands on Facebook and Instagram. You're very, very active there. You're just now starting to build your email list, uh, which is very interesting to me. And so most of the most of the way that you grew was really relationships. How do you turn the faceless internet into you know human relationships? How do you get there? Yeah, well, we we try to get everything to come to us inbound, so we don't do any cold calls or anything like that. We we want to be able to drive enough value so that somebody reaches out to us. That's the goal. And social media is a great way to do that. And so, and, and particularly through video. So that's why we have such a huge focus on YouTube. We do do a lot of YouTube videos um, with marketing tips. So yep. um, youtube.com slash marketing 360 is our channel. Um, there's tons of tip videos. We're giving away tons of great information. We don't ask for anything in return. But what happens is people see this and it, it here again, it achieves our mission because if they're gonna use that information themselves to grow their business, great. Um, a lot of them are gonna see that and realize that there's value in us helping them do that. And they're gonna reach out to us and that's an inbound lead. And so the more value that we can drive across social media, these other channels to generate inbound leads, that's the goal. Because that's gonna be a better conversation than trying to pull call somebody and, and then try to stir them up from there. And that's why email was never a huge part of our marketing program because email is good in a nurturing sense once you've reached out to somebody and built somewhat of a relationship and now i'm emailing them information and we do do that in an automated way but as far as just emailing a list of people um and trying to kick up excitement from there that's a little more difficult and so we've never had a huge focus on that so how do you protect yourself from something that happened to me you know my motto right now is don't build your home on rented properties right because Facebook friends are not your friends, like exactly what happened to me with Google Plus, seven years of content, friends, relationships, done when something changes in the management there. And right now, a lot of people are putting most of their eggs in the Instagram basket, in the Facebook basket, now LinkedIn is coming up with lives and stuff like that. So how do you you know, ensure the success and the growth of your business when, um, you know, when you're building your home and rented properties? Right. Well, I guess I look at it different. I look at it, you know, at marketing at the core is just being where your customers are or your potential customers are. And so those are just channels. And as of today, those are popular channels, but in a month or a year or two years from now, there's going to be something new, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to want to be there. So it's about building your brand. That's what you're, that's what you're investing in. And that's what you want to own. You're maybe renting space on these popular channels. Add in, a, in the process of doing that, but what you want to do is build brand awareness and you want to build and own market share. And building your brand, the best way to do it is to be where the people are. Yep. And the people, yeah. are, the people are on right now, they're on Facebook, they're on Instagram, um, they're on YouTube, um, and, and there's new channels popping up every day where people are spending their time. So when you think about your best customer, um, where are they spending their time and you want to be there. And so you want to build a presence there, but you need to be open-minded to the fact that that could change at some point. So you're just using that as a, as a method of getting your brand in front of your best customers to build your brand. So let's talk about that because I, lo I love that you brought uh, brand up. Uh, you guys are serving, like you said, everybody from a plumber to an author to, um, you name it, right? You you have local businesses, you have online businesses, you have um, international businesses, and you were telling me that everybody has that same strategy where, where it goes with keywords and uh, your website. So let's talk about that a little bit because people are watching it right now. They're probably thinking, well, how do I build my brand, right? Do I need to start with a logo? Do I need to start with a color scheme? Do I need to start with a mission statement? Do I need a website? Do I just need to go live? What, uh, what do you consider is a brand and then how do you go build it? Right. Well, yeah, I think no matter what the business is, the, the general high level strategy is the same, which is uh, today is gonna be search, social, trust, and branding. You're gonna wanna have a, a strong brand, a nice website, 
um, products and services you can sell, obviously. And then you're gonna wanna dominate search and social. So search is gonna be search engines like Google for your best keywords. And you can do that organically and you can do that paid. So there's two different pieces of a search page. And you're gonna wanna be there for the best keywords if possible. Definitely, at least for your brand name, when they're searching your name. Yep. Um, when they're searching your name in reviews, that's very, before somebody calls you or fills out a lead form, 86% of the time, they, they check your name and the word reviews on Google, just to see what that looks like. And if you don't have a good reputation or don't have a reputation at all, they don't even reach out to you. So you didn't even have an opportunity to earn the business. So reputation is extremely important. Yeah. And then social, and, and with social, I would say even more so channels outside of social, just more targeted outbound is what I refer to there. So social for some businesses would be LinkedIn, if it's B2B, uh, B2C would be Instagram and Facebook, maybe Snapchat for younger demographics and those sorts of things. Um, and then you have other channels like digital billboards in a local area, very popular. Digital TV now, you can run TV on Hulu, you can run commercials, right? Um, or Spotify, Pandora, these are all digital channels that you can get your brand out in front of. So a lot of that's going to be budget dependent. So you're going to have to have a budget to invest in marketing. You're going to want to think about where your customers are spending their time. You're going to want to have good branding to get out in front of those people on those channels and then optimize from there. Um, and then, of course, on the back end, you want to nurture with email marketing, text message marketing, have a good CRM and those sorts of things. So no matter what business type you're talking about, that high level strategy is, is pretty much the same. It's just going to get more niche based based on the, the individual strategies inside of those buckets. Like what type of emails are you sending? What type of call to actions or landing pages do you have? Um, you, you know, you'll get more complicated as you move down the funnel that way. So do you feel like people have to have all that stuff figured out before they're starting? They need to know like, okay, this is my mission and this is what I'm talking about. Um, get that done before you even go out there or do you feel like they can start asking the people and seeing what questions coming up just you know engaging and then figuring out stuff as they go yeah I don't think you need to overthink it too much if, if you're confident in the product or service that you sell um, start selling it like sell it however you can and then you'll learn as you go um, but that's that's why we're here you know that's 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 exactly why we're in business is because small businesses they do need help with that sometimes you know they have a great product or service um, they're pretty good at selling it but they need to build their brand they need to get in front of people they need leads they need online visibility and traffic and that's a piece that that is complicated and that's a piece where we can help them um, and then connect the dots from there. So similar to your calls with Jordan, I mean, I'm sure he was trying to help connect the dots with you and provide ideas. And, and you guys were probably spitballing together and kind of coming up with a mini business plan, right? <laughs> that's that's our process with, with all of our calls. And, and so we kind of build off of that. So um, one of the people on Instagram, Michael Treffer was asking, uh, what makes you so unique? I don't know. Am I unique? I, don't <laughs> um, I, I just try to share. I just try to share what I've learned. I guess you know. I I'm not trying to hide anything. You know, if you watch all of you know my marketing tip videos and everything, I I'm not hiding any secrets. I'm I'm trying to tell everybody exactly how to do it and how it works. And so maybe that's unique. You know, um, I just feel like if you're if you're giving people great information, they can take it, use it for themselves, or they're going to see the value in hiring you. I don't, there's nothing really to hide. I need to think about that. So uh, Taylor Swan is asking, what trends have you seen in the last five years and how do you adjust for future changes? Last five years? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, in the marketing world, it's it's like five months is like five years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so five years, I mean, it's heavily moved to social. I mean, five years ago when we looked at a marketing campaign, it was mostly Google keywords is, is what it was. Um, and nowadays it's, it's much more multi-channel. So I would say the new, the new trend is multi-channel. Um, it's being visible across all these channels um, and automation in terms of retargeting and optimization of campaigns to drive better results. That's kind of the way of the future. I like, so in, in reality, can a small business manage all that stuff on their own or do they have to hire or outsource to do that? Um, well, yeah, they can. It, it, it comes down to time. So it depends what, what's the best use of your time. Nowadays, it, it's getting more complicated, so it takes more time. Um, yeah. They had a study I, I saw just this morning. I can't remember who did it, but it was that 
a significant increase on um, marketing uh, cost and spend over the last year in terms of time. So time that people are investing or people that they need to hire to spend time to manage marketing has significantly increased. And it's because of the multi-channel component. Um, you can't just run one campaign on Google AdWords anymore and get by. You have to be managing campaigns across you know, five or 10 different channels. So that takes time. So if you as a business owner have two, three hours a day to do this, great. You know, If you have the budget to hire an internal team to manage it, um, awesome, you know, and if you don't, then there's solutions like us. We're not the only ones. There's other companies out there like us um, that can step in and help as well. Um, Tommy Lurek on uh, on Facebook says, wow, I thought JB will be older. <laughs> JB, you were disappointing people. <laughs> I, I turned 39 last month. <laughs> so my wife, my wife looks really young. Whenever we go shopping, they always get confused and think that uh, my oldest daughter and her are sisters. But I'm, I'm never the brother. I'm, I'm still the dad somehow. So I, I still look older than her. <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, when people are looking for you, uh, looking at pictures of you uh, online, you have your older brother, Joe, right? right that's my dad. That's, oh, that's, that's your dad. dad. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. He says, uh, yeah. He was like, yeah. Um, I, I thought you were brothers. Well, there you go. <laughs> yep, Give that yep. as a compliment to your dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. Guys, if you are watching us right now, you probably want to head over to amthatgeek.com forward slash live. It's going to pop out right here on the screen. Hop on there so you can uh, start interacting us in person. And I'm just going to let you see what's going to happen next. <laughs> So here we are. So hop over, amthatgeek.com, amthatgeek.com. You know, we're going to transcribe it and the automation is not going to catch my accent. <laughs> so uh, Jocelyn, you were first. Let's unmute you and have you pop in. There we go. And you are not Jay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I bet. Thanks so much. It's awesome to be here. Um, first things first is I can totally relate with the dad thing. I actually got asked on a field trip yesterday if I was my son's grandmother. Hello, I am 29 and holding. Come on now. Do I look like a grandmother? But anyways, so I can relate. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, my original question actually was going to be, you know, how did you get into marketing? And of course, why did you choose marketing specifically? But I think that you did answer earlier when you said you kind of just saw a need in the marketplace and just wrote, you know, went with it. Um, but, but I mean, that really was my original. What made you decide to go into marketing specifically? And then, you know, as far as it, it looks like you just kind of tested to see like, you know, okay, is this working? Is this not working to decide which services to offer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did touch on that, but a little bit of the backstory, I, uh, I played football in college and um, my senior year after I had finished my final season, I had another semester left. And so I had an interest in design. Um, I was relatively talented with design. I'm um, just all, since I was a kid, I liked it. And I liked sales and marketing. And so there was an internship um, that, I, that I went for. Uh, it wasn't available, I just kind of made it up. But I went into a magazine company nearby, um, Zia Publishing, they do like travel magazines. And I walked in and said, hey, I like design, I like sales, I can pretty much do anything, I'll work for free, I just want to learn. They said, we don't have any positions right now. And I said, well, I'll do anything, you know, you must have some need. And they said, well, we need a website, you know how to build a website. And I said, no, I don't, but if you give me a desk in a couple months, I'll figure it out. And so they said, okay, so they gave me a desk in a couple months and I figured it out. I, I built the site like three or four times before I showed it to them, I showed it to them, they liked it. And then when I was walking around town and, and just looking around, I realized not a lot of people knew how to do that. And so I had a knowledge that not, not a lot of people had. And so then when I got out of college and started trading futures and commodities, 
I started testing that knowledge. So I rebuilt their site throughout several times. We built online trading platforms and all kinds of technologies. And, uh, and so I did sales and marketing. I did Google AdWords when it very first came out. Um, we were like a beta tester. We, we spent a ton of money and got absolutely no leads. It didn't work at all. Um, but I realized that's where the market was going. And so that's when I was telling my dad all along, like, hey, I think there's a real opportunity here. And he'd been in the trading industry for a while and didn't really like the volatility of it. You know, it's very up and down. And so he wanted something where just our work ethic would pay off. We didn't have to worry about the market. So he was open to it. And uh, we just kept testing things and then really had a good strategy that worked in the digital side. And so when we saw the opportunity to make the leap and, and, and provide those services for small business, we felt like we had a good game plan and we're pretty confident in it. So when we did it, we, it worked. Very cool. And then just one other thing is what you talked about. Um, I know I had something along the lines of, you know, don't build your home on rental properties and, you know, and that's huge. And, you know, you talk about brand awareness and that is absolutely important. Having the brand awareness and being top of mind, because if you're not top of mind, if people don't know who you are, you know, they don't want you. But I, I also, you know, and that's one of the things that's always been big for me is, yes, you're going to be on social media. But as she saw with Google Plus shutting down and having nothing, I totally agree with being, you know, where everybody is. But then also into and then you know bringing them back to your own website so that you then can continue to build the relationship with them through like the email and the lead nurturing and i do think that you did touch a little bit on that as well so is that also part of your strategy that you are bringing them back so that you can you know continue to build that relationship and turn treat the customers absolutely yeah no we want them to come inbound to us once they come to us they're in our database so they're in our they're, they're connected via our website email our crm and all those sorts of things so um the channels are just like lines in the water you know and if you throw more lines in the water you're going to catch more fish and, and if you're fully invested in one channel you're not very diversified so if something like google plus goes away and that's what you were invested in then you're kind of screwed so you want to be able to have more lines in the, in the water you want to be more diversified so you're not completely dependent on one channel and that's why the multi-channel thing is so important today but once they reach out to you and engage with you, you have them in your system. So you thought them at that point. Awesome. Thank you. And so our next uh, person is Stuart. Stuart, can you unmute yourself? And uh, let's see. And hop on in. So Stuart had a really interesting question as you figure out how to unmute yourself. Let me see. I'm going to unmute you. Um, about partnership. So Thank Stuart, you. let me know when you can hop in. There you go. I'm here. Can you hear the, the audio? Yep. Okay, gotcha. Uh, my question is about partnership and both Yifat and I have some both positive and uh, less than positive experience with that. Um, in the instance where for one reason or another, you truly need to bring in a equity partner to your business, um, I made a true blunder and cost myself a seven figure business. However, I'm now rebuilding to a small degree, but if I were to do that again, which is somewhat doubtful, what would I look for in an equity partner? Perhaps when you're just starting out that has complementary skill. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I'm not sure if there's the perfect answer to that, but you just have to follow your gut. You know, I think you have to get to know them and and uh, follow your gut. If you think it's a good partnership, if you think it's somebody you can trust um, that you like working with, that you would be confident with a handshake deal, then I think that's somebody that you go with. If you think it's somebody you really need, you really need to draft up a huge agreement. Um, you know, that means there's a little bit of a lack of trust. So I think that uh, it's really about finding somebody that you, you can trust um, and then you kind of go from there. And if you have any kind of shade of a doubt, um, then don't do it. I used to go off of that method when we did hire and I used to do all the hiring for us for quite a while until we had about 200, 300 people. I hired almost everybody and my interviews were pretty quick and efficient. I just went off of the gut test. <laughs> you know, did I feel good about them? Did I trust them? And, and that just paid off so many times. And I made so many mistakes where I, I thought somebody seemed really experienced. They seemed good, but there was just something I couldn't put my finger on it for whatever reason. I just couldn't put my finger on it. 
whenever I hired those people, it never worked out, you know? So I would just follow your gut on that. Were you, was your background in trading, which is a very data-driven, but highly emotional business, uh, I assume you were doing some day trading as well. Um, was that background useful in making that determination as to whether you felt really comfortable with someone? I, from my personal perspective, the only thing I would add to what you said was if you bring anyone in, make sure you've got some metrics to track what's going on, no matter where I may be. In this case, I had an illness and I was out of state, uh, but make sure you've got metrics to track that person's uh, process. But was your day trading or was your trading background highly useful in, in helping evaluate other people? You know, that's a good, that's a good question and a good thought. I never really thought about that, but, but possibly, you know, um, you know, we dealt with a lot of different people in a risky type of environment. And so you had to really look around the corner all the time and think things through. Um, and so very possibly it could have helped. Um, and I agree with you, you need to set good expectations, you know, with whoever you're partnering with, you know, what is their role? How are they adding value? How are you measuring it right for success? Um, so that it's all clear up front. Totally agree with that. What's your expectation of metrics in general in your business? Uh, well, it, dep it depends which, you know, what we're referring to at, at a high level, it's going to be, um, you're going to, we're going to look at our lead flow, our cost per lead, our conversion rate off of that lead, what that is, what is our churn once the account opens, you know, what the average account size is, um, on that, and those are really the pillars. So if you know your lead cost, you know your opening ratio, you can determine what your CAC is, and then you can look at what your churn is and your and your average account size, and you can determine lifetime value. Obviously your lifetime value has to be better than your CAC or you're losing money. So um, we look at those things and we look at employee churn. So those are some of the things at the highest level, but then you go down to every single position and department and they have their own KPIs that you have to focus on. So. We're very uh, data driven and that does come from the trading. It was very data based. And so we've built the company based on that. Well, and I want to thank you and Aoife both for bringing us uh, some top flight in information. Aoife has got a real talent for that. And obviously you've got a real talent for exhibiting that. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, amazing. Uh, the next person is Eric Smith. Eric, can you unmute my friend? There you yep, go. Can you hear me okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Great. Um, yeah. First, just I'm a huge fan of Madwire. I started following you guys way back in the day when you were back in the Loveland offices, and I think the first uh, reason I found you was because of your culture video. Um, awesome. I think the Illumineers were the uh, band playing. <laughs> I don't know if you still have that video, but it was awesome. And yeah. for what it's worth, that kind of put a uh, idea in my mind of the type of company that I wanted to work for. And so I actually work for a company now that I believe has a very similar culture and it's fantastic. Um, but what I've realized is culture is really not the only thing that's going to drive a business forward. That's not the only thing that's going to promote growth. And so one of the things that I've seen in our company is when I started five years ago, we've doubled in size and that's been great, but we've now plateaued and it's been very difficult to get past that plateau. Uh, we're probably about 120, 130 associates. Um, and, and there's just challenges and we've seen some turnover and we've lost really valuable people. And so my question is, um, your hyper growth is unbelievable. What have you done um, to beat those plateaus? I mean, we, you know, we read books like Scaling Up and, and talking about the, you know, the curves and the dips and how difficult it is once you get to that dip to get to that next level. And so I'm just curious, JB, in your kind of thought process, what have been some of those keys that has allowed uh, Madwire Marketing 360 to just burst through all those plateaus and, and be where you're at today because I mean the reality is most businesses struggle greatly at each of those plateaus and don't even figure out how to get to the next one so what would you attribute to, to that success? Hmm. Well first off thanks for the compliments I really appreciate that um, in terms of plateaus yeah we've hit them too um, we call those glass walls, you know, because you, you're just growing, you're moving right along and then you hit a glass wall and it just knocks you on your ass, you know? And, and then sometimes you have to bang against that 10 times before you break through it. And 
typically when you hit a glass wall, it's because of a process breakdown um, is, is what we've seen. So the processes that work to get to, the, to, to this level won't work to get to this level. So there's an adjustment that needs to occur. Sometimes it's just a, it's a new leadership structure. It's a new leader. Um, sometimes it's, it's taking a department and breaking it into a smaller groups. Um, other times it's, it's just because the product mix needs to be tweaked. You know, there's just a million different things that could occur, but one thing's for sure, something has to change because obviously whatever you're currently doing isn't working if you're stuck anymore. It worked up to that level, but it's not working to get you to the next level. So something needs to change. We've looked at our 410 feedback. It's been super valuable. Um, listening to our customers and making adjustments. I found over the years that the team, the team knows the answer. You just have to listen to the team. Um, and sometimes you might have to just do an all hands meeting and bring people in there, bring the leaders in there and say, hey, what's the struggles? Um, why aren't we selling more deals? Why are we losing more accounts? You know, Find out the true reasoning and then try to figure out the solutions to fix those things is what we've done. So it's worked good for us. And sometimes we've gone sideways for two months and sometimes six months. and. And, and it's taken us a while to figure it out, but generally once you figure it out, you're on another skyrocket trajectory up to the next glass wall. So that's kind of been our process. Just listen to your team and, and value their knowledge. Sure, and then what, sorry, one follow-up question to that and I'll let others jump in here. Um, so with that 410 feedback, we, we do something that I think would be similar through Tiny Pulse and Tiny Pulse is anonymous. And I think that's great but it gives the, the those individuals the ability to still kind of hide in the shadows and not mm -hmm. you know, fully put their heart on the table to have those real conversations. And so right. do you see a big difference on anonymous feedback versus, hey, I know who this person is to help drive those concerns and suggestions in a right manner? I mean, have you seen, yeah, the anonymous is greater, it's terrible, they gotta make sure that we know who that person is. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. The context of knowing, where the feedback's coming from is really valuable. And so on our 410, you know, we're asking who you are. And there is an option to click on there if you prefer to do anonymous, but honestly, we very rarely get an anonymous form submitted. Most people are comfortable speaking up. And I think that's, it's important that if somebody has some feedback that's constructive or, you know, almost negative, that you don't just lash out, right? You have to, you have to listen. There's a reason they feel that way. Um, and that's, that's a fact. Right, and so that needs to be addressed. Is how do we get on the same page? How do we get their buy-in? Understand the why, so people feel comfortable. If people feel comfortable to give you ideas, to to throw the dirty laundry out there and see how you react, that's going to help you improve. If they're not willing to to tell you those things, then you're not going to improve. Like I heard a quote from John Madden once said, "Winning is the best deodorant." because um, it covers up all the stink, right? You don't realize you stink until you start losing sometimes, but you actually stink a lot while you're winning. People just aren't saying anything as well. So that's where we're like, hey, just be comfortable. Like we can always get better. So throw the ideas out there. There's no bad idea. We're not going to do every idea that comes at us, but we want to know about it and talk about it and get on the same page. So that's what we've done. Great. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so there's a question from Kara who's asking, how is marketing 360 better than HubSpot? I get, I bet you get that a lot, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't, I don't, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about certain features, HubSpot's better than us, you know, we're, we're not better than HubSpot on certain things. There's other things that we are better at, them, you know, than they are at. Um, and so it just depends what you're looking at. For us, I mean, just at a high level, I would say that HubSpot's a little bit more of an enterprise or, or a slightly larger business solution than who we typically work with. We work with businesses that are anywhere from one employee to 100, generally. Um, the average customer that we have is probably 10 or 20 employees. And so Marketing 360 is a great solution for them because they get not only the technology, but they get the talent. With HubSpot, you generally just get the talent. You just get, generally just get the technology and then they have support teams and those sorts of things. But with Marketing 360, you get the technology, but you also get the team. So you get a marketing executive, you get dedicated designers, content writers, project managers. You pretty much get your own outsourced marketing team through Marketing 360, but you also get the technology um, with the CRM and the email marketing and the ad management and those sorts of things with Marketing 360. And so it's just a different model and I think a different customer base that we're targeting. I love that. Um, I see Luz Delia here. Luz Delia, do you want to jump in? Not I'd love to. There we go. Thank you, Fai. Um, 
I want to say thank you so much for having Jordan on your team. This young man has been following me for a whole year. <laughs> and uh, finally, I feel like maybe we're ready. And this is a very selfish question. Um, I'm sure you know Michael Lee Gerber, the Emeth legend. And we are your newest customer, or we're a new customer. I don't know if we're the newest. Um, and Jordan has really been amazing in trying to get us to take on your work. And we just weren't ready. And we're just getting ready right now. And so I'm envisioning, and I've, talk, I've spoken to David as well as Jordan about this, because I said, I want to meet you. I want to find out who the owner is and find out how do we, I don't know if you know, we have an online school with everything Michael has created 40 years back in the last 15 years. And so we're looking to see how do we take your work, your product, because I just believe that I understand the concept, especially what you just said, that we get everything under one roof, right? I don't know how many employees you have right now, over 500 or something. So how does that support me and taking Michael and I, our work that we're doing with the Radical You to bring you in as an outsource for every one of our clients, because I know right now, most of them are going through the dream, vision, purpose, and mission. The next part is going to be the client fulfillment. How do they, and when do they get started with organizing all this type of work in a way that's really gonna make a difference to them in order for them to develop what they're developing and as they develop people in their market? Can you share some thoughts about that? Hmm. Yeah, well, the interesting thing, you know, you know, Eric just asked about hitting those glass walls, and th this is a good example of we have 500 something people, almost 600 people now, um, but it doesn't feel that way to our clients like you because you're working with a small team, and so that was one of the adjustments we made. We hit a glass wall because we were building out a huge design department, a huge development work department, a huge marketing executive department. And we started to see disconnects to where the client didn't have as good of an experience because there was so much communication and disconnect and the teams weren't buying into each other um, that it started creating a lot of problems. And so we started to kind of go a little bit sideways. So that's when we broke into what we call the mini mad wires, where we took small groups of designers, developers, marketing executives, put them in the same pod and then allowed them to manage the same customer base. So now they could do real time communication and collaboration. And so even though you're you're coming on board now where we have, you know, close to 600 people, it, you're going to be working really with a, a company the size of 40, you know, which is what fits into that pod area. And so they're going to get to know your brand and your messaging and what you're looking for there. And they're going to make mistakes, just like if you hired an internal team, they're not they're going to misunderstand what you're looking for. We're going to be on, on a different page with regards to the branding or whatever, but that feedback is going to allow us to adjust just as if you had an internal team, they're getting better and better every week. Um, and then start to be able to see around the corner once they understand your brand and your target customers and those sorts of things to give you some direction on how you can better grow your brand and, and build your awareness. And I don't think you would have that kind of an experience if we still had the huge departments of teams, because they just wouldn't be as invested in being a part of your success, you know? But when they're all together on a team, they're all invested in your success. And so what we always say is like, if the customer's not successful, we're not successful at the end of the day. And unfortunately, we still have a lot of cases that aren't successful. You know, we do our very best. And sometimes, you know, there's so many moving parts with building a successful business that um, not, not all of our clients are successful, um, but we do our best. And so we always say, hey, we don't have guarantees here because there's no guarantee of how successful you'll be. We can only guarantee you one thing that nobody will try harder than us. That's our guarantee, right? And we just try to leave it at that. So hopefully that helps. But if you ever have a problem, you can always call or email me. I'll jump in there and try to fix it. So. Awesome, that's great. Well, you know, I'd love to give you a registration or enrollment to our school so yep. that you can see what we have there. And perhaps you can give me some advice because I'm the operator great. as to what best way to get this message out to the people because obviously you are interested in my success i'm interested in my client's success right yeah. if they're not successful and create what michael has been talking about for the last 40 years whether it's beyond emith emith dreamy room it doesn't matter ultimately it's going to be your success that's going to make a difference so if we can add create a partnership with you that we can get 
then to be to the next level, then we got our job done. I love awesome. it. Awesome. And I'll take it. it up. I'll take, I'll take you up on getting in touch with you and creating a stronger relationship. Thank That's you for great. your thoughts. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. So last question, because we are running out of time. Kim Boltman from Instagram is asking, how many women are on your team? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know the exact number, but roughly half. I mean, probably 250, I would say, off the top of my head. Um, we have a leadership team of about 100, and I'm not sure what the breakout there is to be exact, but it, it, may, it may actually be a little more than 50% on our leadership team, but it's pretty even. So do you I find, haven't looked at the exact numbers to know off the top of my head, but we're, we're, we're Do you find that there's a difference? Do, do you find, like, you know, the the minute you started having more women, something changed in the culture, it didn't change, everything was the same. Do you think anything happened there? You know, I, we never think about it. We did, we hire the best person for the position. We don't really care who it is, you know, um, outside of just male and female, just where the person comes from, you know, their their heritage, like none of that even crosses our, we don't even think about it. Like we just want, we just want the person that is the best fit for the job. That's what we're looking for. And in the process of doing that, it's ended up being pretty diverse. So it all works out. Dude, you have no idea how much I love that you said that because I come from Israel where we don't have all those differences where they are in the States, right? Like you're gay, you're white, you're tall, you're black, you think we don't have that stuff. It's like yeah. the right man for the job, right? And then you come here and it's like, wait, when were you born? <laughs> how old are you? <laughs> What's your family? All right. Uh, so I just love that you said that. Um, okay, last question. Tim Sakart from Instagram says, what failures led to your success that you can recall? Oh, man. Jeez. Um, uh, I've been failing at stuff since I was young. I, <laughs> I got held back in second grade. I <laughs> there did. you go. <laughs> I was very slow as a, as a younger guy. Dyslexic, very slow. Um, my mom would ask me every day when I got home from school, hey, can you see the board where you're sitting? And every day I'd be like, why do you keep asking me that? Yes, I can see the board. You know, but later on I realized, okay, I know why she was asking that. I was a little slow. Um, so I, I failed constantly. And I think what that did was probably just build that competitive muscle. Like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna have to work twice as hard to, to end up at the same finish line as these other people. So that's fine. So, you know, it, it built up work at worth that work ethic and uh, that's always paid off for me so so where is uh three no, marketing I, I, 360 I and i, I think hold on so can, Luz I, can i call you back here? when i'm done okay okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i i mute her she unmutes um so um what's next for you guys you said you told me before every time we get bored with something or we're done with something we try a new product we launch a new company what's uh what's next in the horizon well, we're, we're trying to get to 1% uh, of, the, of the market for small businesses that are three years in business and three employees. That's our perfect, perfect customer there. There's five and a half million, million of them out there. Um, so we, we're shooting for 50,000 accounts. That's what we're going for. We're at about 10,000 now. So um, we feel like if we can get there, then uh, we'll be a billion dollar company. That's our goal um, to get there plus. Um, but those are all just a, just a, just a result of doing the number one thing which is just helping small businesses grow like if we just help our customer be successful those things will take care of themselves and so our vision on that is a singular platform you can log into one platform um you can do everything you need to do from there crm email you can access 20 different popular channels online to run ads um, you can do your remarketing through there you can do your online you know billing and, and booking and all of those things through one singular platform which also includes the team of talent that you need to execute those things. And so we feel like if we can build a singular platform um, that uh, is what a small business needs to not only market their business, but also manage their business, that's the ticket. Um, but you do that through building relationships and great customer service. So that's where that human element you know, comes in in the talent piece. So it's a, it's a moving target, but we're always working for that mission. I love that. So guys, if you want to learn more about marketing360.com, go to amthatgeek.com forward slash live right to the right of the video. There's a little banner. You can click on that, head over there, 
um, and you'll get to meet the team. You're not going to get all the prices or anything. There's not going to be emails that are going to be sent to you, even though you are sending a few right now, right? Uh, but yeah. it was mostly going to be a relationship with a real human on the other side of the screen that, like Luz Delia and I were saying, really, really cares about you. Um, so JB, you, you know, kudos to you because you managed to scale, but still keep, you know, the intimacy feeling of a home-based business. And, you know, 10 years, it might seem a long time for someone who's just starting, but right, it's kind of like, it just flew by, didn't it? Oh yeah, <laughs> yep. Time flies, <laughs> it was like yesterday. Yeah, and if you guys want any free information or anything, you don't want to have to talk to anybody, just follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash marketing360. There's tons of great content on there. I try to do a video at least once a week on there. So I think pretty good information to work, work off of. And his videos are really, really good. So um, thank you very much, JB. And you're going to see the company culture right behind JB if you're looking really good in the videos. So it's really interesting nice. how many people are playing pool while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> right. I promise they're working hard too doing that. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, JB, for taking the time. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And we'll see you again in two weeks on I'm That Geek That Show. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.